tired of the current political debate where people throw insults back and forth on Twitter and don't really get to the issues? So am I. My name's Chloe Wesley and I'm filming this series with Reason. It's a series called Change My Mind where we're going to try to do just that. I'm inviting people I disagree with to sit down with me and actually discuss the issues and see if maybe they can change my mind or my perspective on some of these things. Today I'm joined by Ken Livingston and we're going to talk about socialism and the Labour Party. Let's see if he can change my mind on a few things. I, I, I will start with socialism. I do firmly believe not that socialism is immoral when it's been tried around the world and in practice, but I think the idea of it is, is immoral because I do not believe that it is right for the rights of the individual and their choices to be taken away from them. Uh, the doctrine of socialism is about collectivism and collective decision-making from a central technocracy where the, the technocrats or the small group decide here is how society is going to be, here is what you are going to do, here's what you're allowed to say, what you're allowed to do for work. And I, I just feel very uncomfortable with that. I think in societies where people have been allowed to make their own decisions about uh, you know, how to spend their money, to uh, what political party they choose, I, I just think that free societies with a mixed economy mm. like we have today are more prosperous. Mm. And, and everything I've read about um, you know, socialism and, and communism has made me very uncomfortable at a philosophical mm -hmm. level. The idea of taking away individual rights and personhood. Now, what, what, would you, what would you say to address those concerns? I think people's rights have been strengthened under genuinely socialist progressive governments. I mean, communism was a dictatorship. There was never any attempt to pretend it wasn't that. But if you look at democracies, whether it's you know Britain or Germany or France or Brazil or whatever, when they elect what are called socialist governments, so often they're not much more than social democratic, you've always then, I mean, get a wave of improving rights for people. If you've got a quite hard line, basically simply capitalist uh, economy and it's not being properly regulated, as we're seeing now in Britain, lives are devastated. You actually look at the surge of suicides and I mean, people sleeping on the streets and so on. People aren't better off now after these eight years of austerity than they were, even under the very disappointing Blair Brown years. Do you think that's true, though? Because all the evidence points to things like life expectancy, um, happiness, all of these metrics in Western mm. societies and in Britain are on the rise. People are living more prosperous lives, partly thanks to technology um, mm. and, and improvements to, to how things are done. Do you really think that life is a lot worse for the average person in this country well, than it was eight years ago? Basically every decade in Britain, life expectancy has gone up about two and a half years, whether you had a Tory government or a Labour one. I mean, now, over these last few years, it's slowed down. And I think many more people are taking their lives, many more people. I mean, if you're in a really mis if you haven't got a job, you're living in poverty, you're going to die a lot sooner than if you've got a decent job and, you know, you've got a decent level of income. But employment's at a record high. More people are working now than they were before the Conservatives came in, into government. Do you think that the fact that more people are working is well, if any, that was an indicator true, of, of happiness? I, I, I mean, you, if, jobs are, if jobs are the way out of poverty, mm. we have more jobs now than ever before. We have more jobs, but the vast majority are low-skill, insecure, zero hours contracts. They're not jobs people are happy with. If you actually look at the period since the Second World War. In that 30 years after the Second World War, when the agenda was sent by the Labour government in 1945 and carried on by the Tories when they got in, a unemployment a, was considered to be never, it should never go above 2.5%. The Tory Prime Minister Harold Macmillan in his diaries really is worried when it goes above 2.5%. Now we're being told, oh, unemployment's only 4%. That's really good. Well, no, it's not. I mean, at the end of that Labour government in 1945 to 51, unemployment in Newcastle was down to 1%. Unemployment today is about twice the level it was. And whereas most working class men got a really good job in manufacturing, now people are in insecure 
and, and you know, unrewarding jobs, frankly. Life is worse. That's why, as I say, a, we've seen a trailing off of the improvement of life expectancy. And the suicide rate is sore, particularly amongst young people, because mm. a lot of older people have still got the job they've had for decades and they're coming up for retirement. But it's young people now coming out of school or university and just can't get a decent job. Um, they, they're being ripped off by awful landlords. I mean, I, I didn't go to university. I just left school at, in 1962. Every boy got a job. And I, I'm coming from I, just south of Brixton, not a, a fabulously wealthy area. But every boy got a job. I didn't meet an unemployed person until I was about 29 or 30. Um, and, you know, 12 years later, I'd got enough money to be able to buy my first home. That isn't there now. Mm. I, I people do. now are really insecure. I agree with you that housing is probably one of the biggest mm. causes of, of poverty, of, of desperation in this country. And it's probably the biggest contributor to the cost of living. And mm. I, I do think that we have a high, well, it's a high, wage, high wage economy. Before Thatcher got well, in, we were building 150,000 to 200,000 council homes a year. She stopped it. Shamefully, Blair carried on not building them. If well, we'd carried on building disagree, councils, yeah. we wouldn't have a problem. Well, I would disagree with you possibly on a solution, although you might agree with some of the things I have to say about housing, which is that I agree there aren't enough mm. houses being built, but I don't think developers are evil, nasty, bad people. I think they, they make a profit from building lots of houses. At the moment, there You're is evil. a huge restriction on house building in Europe. because of the green belt and also because of the very strict <clears throat> planning regulations and the planning system in this country. Oh, strict That's, regulations. I mean, there we've are been several deregulated. I mean, when no, I came actually, into local the government, are going up. <laughs> our local council would never have allowed a property developer to build a home as small as they're building now. Here in Britain, the homes being built are the smallest in Europe. Those property developers are making the maximum profit they can. They're not providing good homes. And literally, I mean, if I think back, yes, when Thatcher got in, she started deregulating. And one of the deregulations she did led to Grenfell Tower. I mean, if you don't have regulations, I mean, corporations will rip you off. Of course we need regulations, mm. but I think some of the regulations, like height restrictions or restrictions on how many, uh, I think there's something about windows, there's lots of mm. different criteria that I think if you got rid of some of those restrictions, you could have more creative building. Oh, and I did. some of the terrace homes in London, the, the, the old, mm. older homes, mm. they wouldn't currently pass mm. the regulatory regime. But I also think it's the, the land that is not being available to be built on. So well, brown and well, greenbelt land should definitely be looked when at. When I to ran for mayor of London in 2000, we had 32 boroughs in London, each had their own density and height restrictions. And I, one of my pledges was we'll do away with that. Every development should be judged on its merits. And therefore, that's why the Shard was built. I, I mm. actually just, I mean, a lot of people will tell you, oh, it's very, we're really crowded here in London. But London, New York and Paris have broadly the same population. London covers twice the area. We're most likely the least dense great world city anywhere on the face of the planet. And the Greenbelt isn't a problem. We've got you know, a huge potential uh, of land for still building. The key is you've got to have the transport system. So there's no good building homes and people can't get anywhere. Mm. And if you actually look now, Crossrail, which is the biggest rail line we've ever built in London, opens next year. Along all the sites where the new um, stations are, there's property development going on. People are starting planning new, new jobs and things like that. I mean, when I became the mayor, I mean, business was saying, if you can't sort out the transport problem, Firms will be leaving London. We got 8,000 new buses, a massive expansion of our, our underground system, modernising it, and it turned underground. Seven years later, we overtook New York to be rated the leading world city. And so, public investment's crucial. That's in things like education, transport, and I think building homes for rent. And then you create the mechanism by which the private sector comes and invests. You can't, I mean, I'm not in favour of a. a completely nationalised state. I mean, one of the mistakes of the post-war Labour government was having brought all the things like the energy and transport into public ownership. They then moved into what should remain the private sector. There's the things that the state should regulate and provide. Mm. Um, and 
you know, then there's the stuff the private sector will do. But it's no point trying to nationalising the steel industry wasn't going to work. You need steel companies competing with each other. You've just got to make sure you're regulating them so not too many of their workers are dying. Mm. And I, I completely agree. Mm. I think a lot of politics today mm. is arguing where the limits of the state are. So mm. what private industry should do, what the government should provide. Um, I'm not, I'm sceptical about a national building service. I think even if the government is paying for council homes to be built, you probably have private companies, uh, you know, builders, all them local built. businesses coming in the and doing the work. I, when I was a housing chair in, in Lambeth and then in Camden in the 70s, I mean, we built lots of council homes, but maybe we got contractors in and they built them. We said, we, we, you know, we want a new estate here. And then you had several firms bidding to do it. I, there may have been some councils that had their own construction departments, but mm -hmm. I, I don't recall ever coming across one. I don't think I've come across that in, in the UK. I think a lot of projects in Scandinavian countries as well, mm. they do this really, really well, where the state taxpayers pay for public services. Mm. They have very high levels of taxation, but the services are delivered by private providers, mm. which means there's a lot more choice, mm. particularly in education, because mm. they have to compete for you know the vouchers mm. of, pa of families. Um, I, I quite like that system, actually. It's getting the balance right between the public and private sector. Mm. I am... And you know, the private sector will always be bigger than the public sector. Um, but as long as you've got competition, and as long as you're providing good regulation, it works. If you actually look, I mean, 40 years ago, China's economy was just a wreck. I mean, 90% of the Chinese were living in poverty. Now 700 million have been lifted out of poverty. And you've seen the growth of a massive private sector in communist China. Mm. But they've never allowed their banks to become the masters of the economy. They kept them regulated. They, they make certain their banks invest in their country. Whereas here in Britain, our investment's running at about its lowest level since the war. And that's the problem. The biggest single factor in a successful economy is investment, public and private. And broadly, our financial institutions now are just interested in money laundering all the way around the world rather than building new modern um, industries. Well, I think I'll probably disagree on, on that front. I don't think they're all investing um, abroad, but I would like to, to move on um, to another topic. Um, Venezuela, mm. you have written and spoken a lot about this, mm. and I think now I'd really like to come to a greater understanding of your perspective, because mm. often it's very short radio interviews or quotes mm. taken out of, uh, perhaps out of context, you really? might argue. Someone would misquote <laughs> me, good heavens. And I want to understand um, what you think, because I'm, I'm really worried. Um, they have very high levels of poverty, mm. about 87%, mm. mass child malnutrition, mm. um, infant mortality rose 30% mm. in just one year, mm. um, cases of malaria in that same year were up 75%. Mm. Women, this is very disturbing, are opting, apparently, Reuters report, to sterilise mm. themselves because their fear of mm. uh, dying in childbirth and they also mm. don't believe they can actually provide mm. for their children. It's a horrible situation. Uh, there are also hundreds of political prisoners, people that have been detained for daring to speak mm. out against the government. So last year they detained a university professor, for example, who, who criticised the regime's economic mm. policy. Now, there is no right to peacefully assemble currently in Venezuela. Um, there have been thousands of executions and reported mm. um, cases of torture. The UN were denied access to investigate human rights abuses further to confirm whether these reports were true. Mm. The economy has completely uh, collapsed. The IMF say inflation will reach 1 million percent this year. Mm. Venezuelans are, que are queuing for basic necessities. Food, everything is difficult to get, get hold of. Millions are fleeing the country. I want to know what you think went wrong in Venezuela. Well, America imposing sanctions clearly has a devastating effect on the economy. I mean, America's just under Trump started to ramp up its sanctions on Iran and all the predictions are there's going to be a massive increase in poverty amongst the poorest. And these sanctions are actually illegal in international law, but America can just get away with it. They've had a, basically a blockade of Cuba for the last 60 years. I mean, if you look at the history of Venezuela, it's quite interesting. Up until Chavez came into power in 1998, about 200 super-rich families ran Venezuela. It didn't matter who won the election, they were all in the same pockets of these rich families. And Chavez transformed that. I mean, 
a lot of the wealth being created because of the oil, went into providing good education. And when I went to visit Chavez there, he came to London um, towards the end of my mayoral term. And then as soon as I'd lost, one of the first things I did was went there because um, he wanted me to give advice to their candidate for mayor of Caracas. And he was an economy where people were happy, it was growing and it was successful. I clearly, the economic crisis has damaged, in 2008, the banking crisis had damaged economies around the world. But the imposition of sanctions um, by America is completely and utterly unacceptable. That doesn't mean to say the president, president hasn't made mistakes. All politicians make mistakes. But I just think, whether it's Iran or Venezuela or Cuba, and there's a couple of other Latin American countries, it's... It should be it is illegal for these sanctions, but because America is the superpower, it gets away with it. So the political prisoners <coughs> being detained for protesting against the regime, mm. is that a direct result of sanctions from the United States? Do you think? No. Well, basically, I haven't been to Venezuela since 2008. And for the last... Um, I've been out of office for 10 years, so I'm not getting lots of... Interest. All I know is what I read in the papers. Mm -hmm. Oddly enough, I don't always believe what I read in the papers. Um, I mean, Maduro may have made mistakes, but clearly impo America imposing sanction on the economy is devastating. It would be if they did it to us here in Britain. So when, um, when the price of oil was very high, there was mm. a lot of money in the government, they were investing mm. in public services, the, you know, life was pretty good. Mm. When the price of oil tanked, um, the response of, of the Maduro uh, then government mm. was to... Uh, print a lot more money hmm. um, and and do you think that was the right response to, no, I, to that crisis? I think that's a mistake because it's bound to fuel inflation but as I said when I went to Venezuela in 2008 they were just coming up to the elections for the mayor of Caracas and the defining thing about Caracas and it's stunning to go there because as a major oil producer long before Chavez came to power one of the way the governments kept the public relatively quiet was they virtually gave petrol away so desperately poor people all had a bloody car and i remember the gridlock in caracas was stunning i mean on the radio in the morning it would say if you're driving to work take a bottle of water a packed lunch and a book to read because you could be locked into gridlock a I mean, four or five hours and i remember the advice i gave to the mayoral candidate was I mean, you've got to move away from people using their cars, you've got to build an underground system, get people onto buses and all that. Tragically, about the only mayoral election that Chavez's party didn't win was mayor of Caracas, Caracas. a right-winger got in, mm -hmm. uh, who clearly wasn't going to do all of that. So do you think that it is wrong and morally reprehensible to Im imprison and potentially, it's reported, um, engage in torture of political opponents? Well, if all this is true, I mean, of course it's wrong. But, you know, all around the world, I mean, you have regimes doing pretty terrible things. Um, and you've had, I think, some of those very rich um, oligarch families in Venezuela funding far-right groups and acts of terrorism. It's not just government soldiers are, 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 are shooting at people. They're being shot at as well. But do you not see why someone who does believe in freedom and freedom of thought and mm. of the, the right of people to have their own political beliefs would feel sceptical about people that put forward socialism as an ideology? Because in, in nearly every, well, I don't know a mm. single socialist country that has engaged in, has allowed people to engage freely in ideas and to protest the regime. Mm. The ideas have to be mandatory. And that's why mm. well, I think it's opposed by so many from people. The moment Chavez came to power and still under Maduro, they have free elections all the time. People Mass censorship can stand... of the press and of social media? I mean, How can you have an election when no one can say what they really well, feel? Look think? here in Britain. I mean, we don't need censorship because most of our papers are owned by multimillionaires who set out to abuse people like me. I and mean, if you look at my political career, I've been denounced in the media lie after lie after lie. I mean, I've been accused of being corrupt, alcoholic, violent, tax dodging. I mean, when I became the leader of the Greater London Council back in 1981, the Tories were briefing the press that I'd been at a gay party where I'd been sodomised by six men. Now, back in 1981, that isn't the vote when it would be today. And then a year later, they were briefing the press that 
um, special branch how to file my sexual activities mm. with schoolgirls. So I have to tell you, the bulk of lies in our media come from the right, not the well, left. Well, I, I, I have had articles probably no, no, nowhere near the level of yours mm. from from left-wing uh, mm. thinkers. Um, I've been I've been mocked. I've been called names. I've mm. been mischaracterized, and I really disagree with that. But I still think there should be a free press. People should be allowed. To, to write what they think and they should be allowed to post on Facebook I mm. oppose this regime mm. they shouldn't be put in prison for those thoughts and it, can you think of a single example or, or somewhere that to, to reassure my fears about socialism that it doesn't always have to result in, in dictatorship and in this kind of anti-free speech well, way just look uh, our most distinctive socialist government in our history was the 1945 Labour government people weren't sent to prison disagreeing with it. I mean, literally, it created the best period in I mean, my lifetime. I, I mean, I grew up in a world where things were just always getting better. I, and gradually, liberalism came through. You were, I mean, it was illegal to be lesbian or gay in those days. I mean, women were treated like, you know, a possession of their husband. I mean, if you were a woman in Britain in, up until 1965, you couldn't open a bank account without a letter of permission from your husband. Yeah. I mean, so literally, we've moved on a long way. And it, most of that driven by left-wing governments, the, the Attlee government and then particularly Wilson's government failed in economic terms, but you abolished a hanging, a, we allowed homosexuality, we allowed abortion. I mean, literally, don't just assume that socialism and communist dictatorships are the same thing. It, throughout the Western democracies, there have been long, good periods like the Social Democrats in Germany, um, less socialist governments in France, uh, some very good Democrat presidents as well, like Roosevelt, most likely the greatest president in American history, introduced massive public spending. Hey, but when Roosevelt, back in 1933, Introduce benefits for the unemployed. The Republicans said it's the first step to communism. Mm. But I, I'd really like to to read out. These are some of the policies that Chavez and Maduro introduced mm. in Venezuela, and I'd like to know whether you think these would be beneficial in the UK. Mm. Um, so price controls. Do you think that would that would work in the UK? Well, if we suddenly had a energy companies ratcheting up their prices even worse than they do at the moment. I mean, price controls should come in. And this is one of the big debates in our politics at the moment. I mean, the government's talking, this Tory government is talking about I mean, trying to control the, mm. the rise of energy May prices. May took that policy straight from Ed Miliband's yes. manifesto. <laughs> I, mean, I mean, I'd like to see more of that, though, actually. I'd like to see more of political parties saying, I like their idea, I'm going mm. to implement that one. <laughs> because I'm sure we'd agree, they'd mm. agree on a lot more than they know. A yeah. um, couple of other policies. So there were lots... So one thing that um, I also find difficult to wrap my head around with, with the idea of socialism is central planning. So the idea that you can centrally plan an economy, and you made some really good points about the involvement of the private sector in making sure there's investment in the economy. Do, at, at what point do you think um, socialist governments get it wrong? Because central planning has failed every time it's been tried because you have shortages of goods. So do you think that central planning um, would work in the UK? Or do, have you now changed your mind on that a little well, bit? It depends what you mean. If you actually look, uh, Stalin, who was a monstrous dictator, I, when he came to power I, after the death of Lenin, in that period, lead, in nearly 18 years leading up to the start of the Second World War, the growth of the Russian economy was the most in human history. Uh, that was all centrally planned. Now, that was starting from a very primitive backward thing. We're a much more complex economy, but you still need planning. But that planning needs to bring in businesses, central and local government, trade unions. And if you actually look, I mean, when I became the leader of the JLC, we established an um, industry and employment department, and they spent years drawing up a big plan about how London should develop. And so in 1984, I think it was, I announced that the government should fund the creation of a nationwide broadband 
We called it fiber optic cable system in those days. Thatcher's government did nothing. Six years later, I was on Labour's National, etc. We were drawing up the manifesto for the 1992 election, and I was proposing that. And one trade union leader said, this sounds like science fiction. But, you know, I work with people who are thinking long term. Now, if Britain had done that back in the 1980s, we would be Silicon Island. We would be booming with good high-tech jobs. And so you do need to think long term and plan. Government needs to come in and help. But you need, it's got to be a consensus that is built up between the government and business. But when things go wrong is, is when a small group um, in a central location, in, in socialist regimes, it's the bureau, bureaucrats who decide, OK, here's how much we're going to produce of X mm. to fulfil the needs of society. And the problem with that is that mm. it's very difficult to centrally plan everyone's needs and desires and, and wants. I think the market does mm. a much better job of catering well, to the millions of free exchanges depends, between people and, and where you decisions. Are. As I said, Stalin created the greatest level of growth in human history. But also it led Central. to mass starvation. Five million people starved to death. That wasn't because of his planning. That was because... The, the, the Kulaks were broadly hostile to his regime, so he killed them. It was nothing to do with the economic planning. Then if you look at China, China, as I say, the most dramatic increase, lifting 700 million people out of poverty. And what's their level of investment in their economy? Almost 50%. And when they adopted more free market mm. liberal policies yeah. and they, when they allowed people to freely mm. exchange goods and services, it's not entirely that's free market. The thing. That's, that's when poverty reduced and that's why I believe in free market but, economics. But that's the point I'm making. If you've got a very backward economy, central planning can move it forward very rapidly. By the time you get to one like ours, which is incredibly diverse, strong centralised planning doesn't work. But you've got to get consensus. You need business people thinking... Where does my company go over the next decade? And the most successful business people do think long term. Mm, I completely agree. But mm. I, I think one of the conditions mm. of the success of the British economy is that it's very trusted. The institutions are trusted as the English language. The common law system, for example, is something that people cite as a reason for high. There's a high level of, of trust if you look at polls of people around the world. They, Britain is a trusted country, at least to do business. Yeah. I also think the, the tax burden, yeah, I would argue, laws, is a bit too high, yeah. but it's not as high as it is in some mm. European countries. And I, I would fear that changing. I would fear a, a very left-wing government oh. coming in and taking away the incentives to invest and grow. You, you just need to look at the history of the post-war period, the, the 30 years after the war, when you had a Keynesian economy, and when the Tories came into power, they broadly carried on with Labour's policies. We had better levels of growth and investment than we've had in the 40 years since Thatcher came to power. And, you know, you have to ask yourself, I mean, what did Thatcher get wrong? I mean, massively cutting on public spending and public sector investment. I mean, and you look at the, the government we've got now, since... The Tories won under Cameron in 2010 and unleashed this wave of I mean, cuts in public spending. It hasn't created a strong growing economy. Our debt has soared. If you actually look, no, 1945, two, nearly two trillion well, pounds. <laughs> in 1945, that Labour government, because of the war, inherited a debt 250% of GDP. 30 years later, it was down to 40%. We're still seeing our debt rising under this austerity nonsense. So, Austerity doesn't get you out of a recession. It doesn't build a strong economy for the future. You need to get increasing investment, more people in work, an economy that's growing. You just contrast the 30 years of Keynesianism and the 40 years of neoliberalism. And the, the, the data shows you the Keynesians did better. Do you think that China was wrong then to adopt more neoliberal and pro-market policies? I mean, neoliberalism talks about cutting taxes, but most of the cuts are for the super rich and the giant corporations. And they don't then use that money to improve investment and create new jobs. Well, it gets laundered all around right the world in all sorts of dodgy deals and so on. And you look at the banking crisis. I mean, hmm. literally, when Roosevelt came to power, he passed, well, he signed into law, the Glass-Steagall Act that separated your local high street bank from your dodgy investment banks. They were separate. So if the investment banks went down, they didn't take the high street banks with them. We had similar rules here. Then in, 18, in 1906, no, no, 
1986, Thatcher abolished those rules. And then Clinton in 1998 repealed Glass-Steagall. Ten years later, we have the worst banking crisis since the Great Depression. You need to regulate the banks. You don't need to control them, but make sure they're not doing dodgy things. Because what's happened? We had to save the banks or people would have, their savings would have just gone. It would have been catastrophic. So we've had to create, what is it, £130 billion of extra money to prop up the banks? Mm. We'd much better if we'd use that to create jobs for ordinary people. <laughs> well, most people would agree with you completely <clears throat> that there needs to be a level of regulation mm. in, in most markets. Um, Bitcoin's a very interesting one because there's a market that's currently not too regulated at all. And it's it's risky because you're, you're at more risk of I being taken advantage of. I would have nothing to do with that. Or, so whatsoever. I'm coming around, I mean, I know a lot of people have, have been working on me um, and my libertarian mm. views, and I, I do think some regulation is really necessary, mm. especially to protect people from things like you know, fraud and being lied to. Mm. I, think, I think that's a very important thing, mm. but not to the extent that you make it um, d too difficult to start a business or the hassle can't outweigh the benefit of starting a business, which is why I worry about very high levels of, of taxation, particularly on small businesses that are trying to compete. I'm, but why would they, if when they do compete, 60% of their profits taken away? When people, I mean, Jeremy Corbyn and me have been on the same side politically for 45 years. When I was leader of the GLC, when I was mayor of London, we provided financial assistance to help new firms get off the ground. We did that particularly high tech as well. I mean. A good socialist government works with the private sector to create new jobs, particularly ones that are going to increase your exports and mm. I mean, good high-skilled mm. jobs that give people a decent quality of life and a pension when they retire, not you know, working zero-hours contracts and just being able to pay off your rent. Well, but those jobs aren't created by the government at all. They're created by businesses, and when they do have... Uh, that are allowed to keep enough of their profit to invest back into their business, mm. that's when they can afford to hire people, which is why I'm very concerned mm. about rhetoric in you know, Corbyn and McDonald's manifesto about increasing you know, taxes on the corporations. Corporations are businesses <coughs> run by people. And so it's this idea that you're taxing an entity, you're not taxing mm. a people, you're still taxing people. And that is a high level of taxation. What you're saying is they're not going to spend it as well as the government, okay? The government's going to spend it really well on nice things and you would spend it on, you know, yachts and nasty things. Well, but I think most companies, when they have a profit, they invest back into their company and then they can afford to employ more people. Well, you, and that's the reality of poverty. be delighted that Donald Trump slashed corporation tax Absolutely. when he got in. What's been the result? The debt of America has gone up by a trillion dollars. That's an issue. That is an issue. Mm. That is something that not a lot of people well, are talking about. I... But also, seven, over 700 mm. companies have documented either bonuses, mm. pay rises for their staff, and further investment into their business. Yeah. And I think that's a really good Who's thing. Who's got the biggest bonus? The, you know, the chief executive who's wandering around with millions and things like that. Literally, inequality. I mean, between 1945 and Thatcher coming to power, inequality in Britain was hard. Now it's more than doubled. We are as unequal today as we were in 1914. That doesn't create a better society and world. Well, they literally, if more money, if, if giant corporations and the super rich are paying a fair share of tax, that money effectively goes into the pockets of the middle class and the working class, they spend it. If it stays in the pockets of the super rich, they don't, they, you know, they have it in all sorts of dodgy deals, you know, I mean, on are some tiny just, island in mm -hmm. the... Uh, you know, the Caribbean or something. Well, I think you wouldn't have, they wouldn't have the same incentive to avoid the tax or to put their money offshore if it, it was low enough and also the tax system was simpler. So one thing I'm interested to hear your views on is tax simplification because I think at the moment the tax code is very, very complicated if you compare it to somewhere like mm. Hong Kong, for example, mm. or Singapore. It's very, very complicated mm. and there are lots of loopholes that teams of accountants can find to, mm. to get you know get the break to make the, get their clients off paying mm. off paying tax essentially and it's entirely legal mm. and so I, I, a lot of politicians talk about tax avoidance and making the companies pay their fair share but if you made it a really simple system there wouldn't be anywhere to hide you wouldn't be able to mm. have the larger corporations wouldn't have that unfair mm. advantage over the smaller businesses mm. who of course you know can't afford the accountants mm. to find all the rules. So do you think the tax I can think agree. Well, when Thatcher and Reagan came to power, 
they made massive changes which allowed, I mean, this vast increase in you know, accountants laundering money all around the world, avoiding paying tax. I mean, and the simple fact is, back in that 30 years after the Second World War, both in Britain and America, corporation tax and tax on the rich were, I mean, under the Republican President Eisenhower in the 1950s, the top rate of tax on individuals was 90%. Here in Britain, it's 98%. But our economies were growing stronger and we were getting more investment. Those firms, although they were paying more tax, were also investing more. Now, we've cut taxes on corporations. They're investing less in their firms than they used to before. Do you think they line that their own pockets. cutting tax on corporations resulted in more or less revenue for the government? I mean, it, less revenue for the government, but also... I mean, the, but it the resulted in more thing revenue is, for the government. If you cut taxes like Trump has done, why aren't we seeing a massive increase in investment in the American economy? But they are. So there are there's a, there's a, a very a, slight Americans for tax reform but, have a list of every single company mm, that's given their staff a bonus, a pay rise, mm, and have invested in opening mm, new parts of their business but, or back into their business and research and development. So I think the evidence is there. And it's, it's only just getting started. But in the two years under Trump, the rate of American jobs going abroad has increased three times. Than it was under Obama. I mean, I think I mean we're heading. I mean, the IMF has predicted that in the next American presidential election year, 2020, they expect the American economy to now just be growing at one percent. I mean, at the present time, I mean, the American economy is growing at a lower rate than under any president since 1945. Mm. And why do you think that is? Because literally, I say the, the choice is simple. You can either have the Keynesian economics of that post-war era or the neoliberal economics since Thatcher and Reagan. And I do know, it's very interesting. When Thatcher was forced out by um, her own Tory MPs, the following year, the BBC's Panorama programme spent a year doing a detailed uh, programme on her economic legacy. The BBC has never broadcast it because it shows, basically, Things were worse off under Thatcher than they were before. But that's just not that's just not true. We we strongly disagree on that because what what the the really liberating thing about what she did was that she created a more level playing field. So when she did want to liberalise the the markets, it was actually the upper class, the established um, aristocracy, that were opposing her just as much as the trade unions because. I believe the aristocracy didn't want to have to compete with working class boys for jobs, boys and girls, but also I think one of the fears of the trade unions was, well, if all these people start working and, and going into the city and earning money, they might like having that money too much and they might not agree with our communist cause anymore. But the simple fact is that before Thatcher, we had a more rapidly growing economy and high levels of investment. In this neoliberal era, we've not equaled that period under Keynesianism. It just hasn't produced a better economy. More people are in appalling jobs, more people are out of work. But you're selling this really dark picture of Britain and it just doesn't stack up in reality because by any, by most measures, I know you mentioned suicides are increasing, mm. I'd be interested to read more about that. By most, by most measures though, Life is getting better. The average British person today has a higher living standard than the time that you were talking about. And I think a lot of that is down to, to capitalism and, and free markets. Yeah, but you average out, yes, there's an elite that have gone from being rich to super rich. Then the average middle class family is really struggling. Their income in real terms is down on what it was before the banking crisis. And for the very poor, it's devastating. Yeah, I mean, if, we go wandering around the streets tonight. The number of people sleeping on the streets is worse than at any time in my lifetime. I, the suicide rate amongst young people has soared horrendously. I mean, the level of violence and crime. Because, as I said, when I left school, every kid got a job. Now they aren't. They're getting caught up in gangs and crime and things mm -hmm. like that. It's scary. Diane Abbott said a, um, a similar thing on, on Question Time, which, which I agreed with. She said that... You know, if you have a community of young people and there aren't opportunities for them, there aren't those jobs mm. at, the, at the end of school, that, that you see high levels of crime. And I, I think that's completely mm. right. And, and I think that's why we do need those pro-growth 
policies pro-business well, so that there are those jobs for, for young people? Because what are you going to do if you don't have an opportunity I, or any hope? I grew up on council estate in Tulse Hill and I never saw a boy with a knife. Last week, a kid was stabbed to death on that estate. I, and I literally, I don't ever recall seeing any kid with a knife throughout my childhood. Mm. Now, it's become pretty scary. I mean, we are definitely in a worse world than the one I grew up I grew up in a world where everything got better all the time. We're optimists about the future. People aren't. That's why they voted for Trump. They're angry. Democrat presidents, whether it's Carter or Clinton or Obama, they did not stop the collapse of good manufacturing jobs. And that it was those old Democrat manufacturing states that put Trump in power. Mm. And here that anger turned into the Brexit vote. I mean, because people think, my life's worse off, we must change something. I and like, if you get yeah. someone like Jeremy Corbyn, who clearly is offering a, a better way of life, I mean, you get the biggest increase in the Labour vote since 1945. I mean, it's amazing. Everyone assumed Labour was going to be devastated at that election. Hmm. We came within 2% of overtaking the Tories. It was, and it was if very get, surprising. Well, if very, Bernie very Sanders had got the Democrat nomination rather than Hillary Clinton, Sanders would have won because he was connecting with working class people who were angry. Hillary Clinton was just seen as part of the establishment. Mm -hmm. And I mean, the, I remember the, on the night Obama won, tears ran down my face because I thought, for the first time since the assassination of Robert Kennedy, we got the chance of a president who's going to transform things. What I didn't know was, the moment he got the Democrat nomination, he was straight off to Wall Street to assure them he wasn't going to change their way of life. I think um, it was, there's lots been written about the Brexit vote and it was it was for this reason or, or that reason. I'm open to the possibility that actually people looked at the European Union and decided, you know what, we're better off not, not in this club. Um, mm. I don't think it was about economics. I think people heard the arguments about economics, <clears throat> but I think it was an instinct that actually Britain should be, my national government should be making decisions about my tax policy and, and immigration and everything, not a, a, a kind mm. of supranational organisation. I think I think the Brexit vote, we, it's very easy to say it's just because people were disenfranchised. I think that had a big part to play. But I think people also heard the arguments and, and, and made a decision well, about the EU. I think the driving force in the Brexit vote was immigration and people saying, these immigrants come here, they take our jobs, they take our homes. I mean, but the truth is, Labour and Tory governments for 40 years have not invested in making more homes. They haven't created good jobs in manufacturing. When Thatcher came to power, I think we had about 8 million jobs in manufacturing. Now it's down to 2 million. Um, and so people were angry. I, I don't think they were particularly caught up about the nature of the bureaucracy of the, the, the EU. They just thought the EU allowed all this to happen. But the simple fact is, I mean, over half of the immigrants who come here don't come from the EU. So and one of them the from outside the EU. The Tory government could have completely clamped down on that over these last eight years, but they haven't. Why? Because 70% of the immigrants who come here come with a degree, and it boosts the economy. There are more immigrants in London than anywhere else in Britain, and London is the only region in Europe that equals American levels of productivity and competitiveness. It's because immigrants aren't our problem. It's the failure of governments to actually create good job opportunities in homes. No, I think it's completely sensible to say that a national government accountable to people should be in control of these policies and making mm. decisions about these policies on, on lots of areas. I think if the EU had, st had stayed as a trading bloc, we wouldn't have had that referendum. Mm. It was the increase of the, the political mm. um, nature of, of the EU. What, well, what do yeah, you... but there's good things. I mean, mm. EU regulations say that people have got to have four weeks holiday a year. And I don't have the slightest doubt that most of those Tory MPs who wanted us to leave, they want to leave so that once we're out, we can stop all that, you know, do oh, away well, with I that. Think that. And then there's the environmental checks and balances. But if they did that, I don't think they win another election. So there was this this, this argument that mm. they're going to if someone came in, they would take up away all of our rights because the EU protects the rights. What what government in today would say, okay, we're going to repeal the Equal Pay Act and we're going to go back on those rights? I think well, I they'd be what. absolutely mad to, and they're smart enough to know they wouldn't win an election Listen, if they did that. I, I'll make a bet with you. Have me back here in a few years after, if we've had a hard Brexit, I bet you you'll find almost all those good regulations have been done away. What's the first thing this government did when it get, got in? 
massively cut back investment in green energy. A devastating for our environment. And now what they're doing? Oh, we want a big expansion of fracking. I mean, why don't they just kill us you know, quickly now, not allow climate change to do it over the next 30 years? Well, I think, I hope that one of the great things about the private sector is that people are encouraged to be innovative. And I think, well, fingers crossed, I think the private sector will deliver affordable, mm. renewable energy for people. I think that's the long-term solution to this. It's finding a source of energy that is as cheap and as available well, to people. Well, uh, because This ca- government has been trying to get nuclear power stations built, the most expensive way of providing energy, at the same time as cutting back on investment in green energy. I, literally, I, if we set out to say, and I think this is one of the things that could transform our economy, we want every home and building in Britain to be brought up to standards in terms of insulation, a photovoltaic cells and solar panels on the roofs. We would create hundreds of thousands of new jobs and create a, a big green energy industry, which could then start exporting as other governments realise the world's heading towards disaster by the end of this century. So uh, a mass job creating you know, public program, would that be one of the solutions or, or one of the proposals you'd make to Corbyn today to I mean, literally, help investing in tackling the problems of energy and climate change is going to create vast numbers of new jobs, but also help to save the planet. I mean, the current levels of increase in, in global temperature suggest we're heading towards perhaps extinction by the end of the century. And literally, at some point, there'll be a great panic And those countries that have put themselves at the the cutting edge of developing new environmental technologies will make a fortune. Well, that's why I think it makes such good business sense. Like if if Mm. you're looking to invest in something Mm. today, the the company or the organisation, perhaps even government organisation, who comes up with or is able to find the solution Mm. to a a cheap form of renewable energy, because that's a problem, isn't it? It's it's that everyone would like to have green renewable energy power their homes, Mm. but it can be very expensive. Not as expensive as a nuclear power plant. Not as damaging as fracking. Mm. I mean, literally, the, the, the degree of public spending that goes into helping to build a nuclear power plant is horrendous. How much is it? I don't know. I don't know. I mean, yeah. it's billions. I mean, and almost all of them have failed. And then even when you build one, it might suddenly explode catastrophically, as we've seen. Yeah. Don't want that. <laughs> don't want that. So on, on the area of uh, spending, is there any part of government spending that you would like to see come down, that you think they're wasting money Absolutely, on, on military this? military spending. Really? I mean, the, one of the biggest mistakes that post-war Labour government was to get caught up in America's Cold War. And still today, I mean, Britain is spending twice as much on its military as Germany does. Well, Germany's a lot closer to Russia than we are. I mean, nobody seriously thinks Putin's about to invade Britain. But here we are spending, and literally, if you look, in terms of jobs created by public spending, spending on the military creates less jobs than any other form of public spending. The one that creates the most is arts and culture. Mm. Well, I, I think... I think state the state shouldn't be funding arts programs. I think state should fund education, oh, yeah, but yeah. If, education. But as if, well, yeah, yes. but, yeah. But but I personally I've been to some state funded art exhibitions, mm. and I I don't think they're necessary. I think if you can't make if people don't like your creative art enough mm. to want to pay for it themselves, you shouldn't you shouldn't be creating mm. it. That's, that's something I believe well, very strongly in, especially when you see. I my, think the government well, my cuts, I funded helped to fund good concerts, yeah. but. I mean, not so much, you know, you know, great orchestras, you know, more mm. pop groups. But I, I think as well, there's an issue with a government saying, here's your criteria for the art you're mm. going to create. I think people, if you're creative, you no, don't no. want those limits on but you. But you wait for an artist to come to you with a suggestion. Mm. I mean, I'm a politician. I'm not going to come up with some great creative <laughs> idea about the arts. Maybe you might. <laughs> Maybe. The musical, Ken Livingston. <laughs> <laughs> Is there anything else you'd like to um, talk about today? Uh, we could just sing Oh Jeremy Corbyn. <laughs> you can sing Oh Jeremy Corbyn. <laughs> <laughs> Not with my voice. I mean, I literally... No, I just think the next election is going to be absolutely fascinating. Mm. Uh, because literally we've had all this nonsense that Jeremy was going to lead us to a disaster. And there's a wonderful BBC documentary that followed four... Labour MPs on election day, 
all of them critics of Corbyn, and they catch their face as they see the exit poll showing that we made massive gains. That none of them can believe it. Mm. Yeah, I spent yeah, months going around seeing Jeremy can win the next election because the same thing happened to me when I became leader of the GLC. Thatcher said I was, my plan was to impose on Britain a communist tyranny like Eastern Europe. Immediately I was subjected to a wave of hate. I was attacked three times. But then you know, four years later she asked to abolish the GLC election because the polls showed Labour was going to win 84 seats and the Tories just four. Mm. I mean, literally, I mean, my poll ratings after about six months of all this hatred was down to 18%. But 18 months later, I was elected runner-up to the Pope in the BBC Man of the Year poll. <laughs> As an atheist, that's quite surprising. So do you, would you be able to provide some assurances then to people like me who are very afraid of how socialism has panned out in other countries, particularly in Venezuela? Do you think... Do, would, would, please, I'd like, to, I'd like to know, do you really think... That, that Jeremy Corbyn would, as he threatens to do, you know, clamp down on, on the press and, and, and on... And I mean, on, on not would, would, would clamp he clamp down on the press? Well, he did that video where he said change is coming and it was a direct threat to, to newspapers who were writing articles um, about him being a spy or something. Yeah. And he said, and you know, ch he said change, change is coming. What is, what is that well, change? Look, is it, is this, it like Maduro's regime? But this is what's so appalling about our media. I mean, it was back in the summer, and there were all these stories saying that back in the late 1980s, when we were MPs, me, Jeremy Corbyn, John McDonnell, were giving information and confidential information from the British government to the Czech spies. Well, John McDonnell wasn't even in Parliament. And even when we had a Labour government, Jeremy weren't given any government documentation. It was just a complete lie. But it was running all over the front page of the Tory press. Now, that is not a free press. And that's a press in which a few billionaires I mean, own the papers and they will do anything to stop Jeremy getting elected because they know Jeremy is going to stop them um, dodging their taxes. So how would the system have to change? I, I'm, I'm not aware of any proposal by Jeremy to get involved in monitoring the media at all. What he did at the last election was largely ignore the newspapers and communicate directly with voters over the internet. That's why we did so well. But and that's actually just what happened with the, I mean, not someone I support, the new president of Brazil. I mean, his campaign, deeply reactionary, but he communicated with Brazilians over the internet. Like Trump, bypasses yeah. the media and it's just a, tweets. So newspapers don't matter as much as they did say 30 years ago when I think everyone was reading them. I think it matters though that they are free to criticise and and to mock people if they create if they put out inaccurate mm. claims there should be a system mm. whereby you can say hang on that that's wrong and there should be a system there but I do very strongly believe that in order to have an informed society uh, to make decisions they need to be free to express themselves and their concerns about a you, government you and that's why I was concerned about that video that he made about you, change coming but you can't possibly think it was right that those right-wing newspapers were able to run stories implying that I was supporting the IRA bombing campaign in London. That's what led to me being attacked three times. And the problem is, unless you're a super rich person, you can't afford to sue. Our libel laws, laws are just for the very rich. I mean, literally, I mean, how can it be that, you know, you can be lied about like that? It's mm. appalling. One, one thing that I, I, I would like to clear up, because I think... You've spoken about this lots of times, mm. and sometimes perhaps you have been taken out of context, you might argue. All my life. All your mm. life. What were you really trying to say about, about Hitler? I mean, was it just a careless thought that you had mm. that, here's, here's my response? Or I, I really don't understand why you said that and what you meant by Hitler being a Zionist. Well, no, basically, you had the Labour MP, John Mann, that day, I was doing interviews saying there isn't a problem with anti-Semitism in the Labour Party. I mean, I've been in the Labour Party for almost 50 years. I've never heard or seen anyone do or say anything anti-Semitic. And actually, uh, at that day, 80 Jewish Labour Party members published a letter in The Guardian saying that none of them had ever heard anything anti-Semitic in all their hundreds of years in the party. Because if you're a bigot, you're not going to join the Labour Party. Um, well, I think there are plenty of, of bigots on all sides of politics, but, and there have been several we've, cases of anti-Semitism no, no, in the Labour Party. No, no, there aren't. I mean, 
we've just seen that the party has produced a big um, report on, it's gone on the internet, it's found that 47 Labour Party members have tweeted something anti-Semitic. That's one out of every 10,000. Um, and I was simply you know, saying that this is a diversion to try and undermine Jeremy. And I was asked the question, uh, is what Hitler did legal? And I simply said, well, look, there are two phases to Hitler. In the 1930s, he supported the German Zionist movement. Uh, and then he went mad and killed six million Jews. But then three hours later, uh, after that, no one, no journalist took this up with me, because you only have to go on the Holocaust Memorial website in Jerusalem, and one of the papers you can download is about the deal that Hitler did with the German Zionists. Um, but then you have a Labour MP screaming in my face that I'm a Nazi apologist, and then going on television saying, I said Hitler was a Zionist. Well, how can anyone say a man who loathed Jews all his life was a Zionist? And it's I damn in damn our media that not a single journalist um, asked what I'd actually said. It was all dead. Oh, we apologise, we do apologise. But do you, do you accept that, that it might have been careless given that the, the weight of emotion about that name and also about what he did... No, no. There, was, was it just, did you just think, just not think about it? No, no, because you, if, if it's a historical could... fact. I mean, if I say that, you know, the Normans invaded Britain in 1066, people aren't going to, you know, go mad about that. And literally in the, the two weeks after my suspension by the bureaucracy, Jeremy had no say in that, um, somewhere between 30 or 40 people came up to me on the street saying, I'm Jewish, I know what you said is true, don't give in. One woman said, you know, don't these MPs read the history? Or clearly they don't. The German Zionists and the Nazis loathed each other. But they had one thing in common. The German Zionists wanted Germany's Jews to go and live in Palestine. And Hitler wanted Germany's Jews to leave. So that's the deal they did. And it wasn't just that. I mean, Eichmann was taken on a tour of Jewish settlements in Palestine as a way of saying thank you, because he started selling the Haganah uh, Mao's pistols, which right. were then not just used to kill Arabs, but the British troops. But I'm saying, do you think maybe... You had, a, you you had a six years of collaboration uh, between the Nazi government and the German scientists. I mean, I say not because they liked each other, but they had a shared objective. So you said that Hitler was supporting Zionists and allied with them. But it sounded like you were saying he was a Zionist himself. He was supporting Zionism. Don't you think that was a really careless thing to say in that way, especially because lots of anti-Semites actually do you make that uh, comparison between uh, Jewish people and the Nazis? Let me give you one answer. I, when Hitler came to power, 23 German Zionists sent him a, a, a letter saying, we support your proposals we believe it's right that you should keep the racial purity of Germans. We want the same for Jews. So there was a lot in common. But back in those days, that sort of attitude was predominant all over the world. I, I just, I failed to accept, I really failed to accept your assertion that there is no problem with anti-Semitism in the Labour Party. I mean, do, do you really not see what is happening and, and feel, feel hurt and alarmed and saddened for the Jewish community, that they feel that the Labour Party doesn't welcome them and, and is a home for anti-Semites? Well, as I say, the Labour Party spent two years poring over all the stuff their people tweet. They found 47 who tweeted something anti-Semitic. That's one out of 10,000. That's why, I mean, in all my time in Labour, I've only ever heard one racist comment. That was a white man back in 1970 saying, if blacks want to be a part of Britain, they shouldn't be singing Young, Gifted and Black. Now, that's the only racist thing I've ever heard. The trouble is, the media are screaming these headlines about anti-Semitism. But then you say, what are the examples, please? I mean, there are several you actually examples. Look, the eight years I was mayor of London, anti-Semitic incidents went down 50%. Then under Boris Johnson, the Tory mayor, they more than doubled. Why? Because when I was mayor, I worked with the Jewish community, we put on Jewish events, open to all Londoners, just as I did with Muslims and Hindus. My job as mayor was to encourage tolerance between the different faiths, the different races in the city. Uh, and uh, Boris, it was an awful lot of pandering to uh, Islamophobia and 
depicting every Muslim as a terrorist and things like that. But we're getting off topic here. I'd like to hear your views on the Labour Party mm. and how do you think after these uh, cases of anti-Semitism, you would allege um, or are very minor mm. and unimportant, how do you think it impacted the Jewish community when the Labour Party NEC had this big debate about changing the definition of anti-Semitism mm. to make it easier to compare people that support Israel and Jewish people to Nazis? No one's ever suggested that we should allow people to compare Israel to the Nazis. I mean, the de debate was, should people be able to criticise the policies of Israel towards the Palestinians? Absolutely. And that's all it's ever been about. And the simple fact is that a Jeremy you know, agreed to accept that definition. But since then, two rabbis in London have alleged that the vice president of the board of deputies of British Jews has said something anti-Semitic. What was it? She criticised the Israeli government's recent laws discriminating against the Palestinians. I, I definitely agree that you do mm. need to ha make it okay to criticise mm. governments and regimes. I don't think anyone would disagree mm. with that. What was concerning was the need to take away some examples in that definition mm. to allow people to compare mm. the two. And I just don't see the point of adopting a version or a definition of anti-Semitism that disenfranchises the Jewish community. I think their yes. import is probably the most important in this process. And they were the, the community expressing concerns no. about the Labour Party not adopting that definition. No. The reason there was a long debate before they did adopt it was that a couple of the examples are poorly worded and can be used to um, denounce anyone criticising Israeli government policy as anti-Semitic. And as I said, I mean, you've just had two rabbis in London accused the deputy of the board of deputies of British Jews of being anti-Semitic because she criticised the recent laws passed by Netanyahu's government, which frankly discriminate against Palestinians. Now that doesn't mean to say they're anti-Semitic. If you're, how can the board of deputies be accused of being anti-Semitic? It's just bizarre. But the, this thing has gone mad. The simple fact is, I'll make another prediction for you. Under Jeremy Corbyn's government, anti-Semitic incidents, homophobic incidents and racist incidents will go down, just as they did under my eight years as mayor. Do you know that there are a lot of, in surveys, that shows that there are a lot of Jewish families and communities who really fear Jeremy Corbyn becoming Prime Minister. How do you think that well, Corbyn and the party can win their trust back? Because I, don't, I, don't, I think it's an, um, I, I don't think they will be able to. I think there's a real fear about him enabling people who are very pro-Palestine or anti-Israel, mm -hmm. but who cross that difficult, that, mm. that very blurred line between actually being mm. anti-Semitic and having this hysterical conspiracy theory about you know, Jews running the world. And mm. you, you see this, this stuff everywhere. It's really, really concerning. Well, I have never heard anyone say any of those things in my life. And literally. But, but how, but just because you personally haven't heard this, how can you say with absolute certainty that the experiences, the lived experiences of people and the documented cases in the Labour Party of people using anti-Semitic language, how can you disregard that by saying, well, I personally haven't heard it, so therefore it's not a problem? But look, in a party with over half a million people, the fact that 47 have tweeted something anti-Semitic, I'm unlikely to have bumped into any of them. I literally, one, one of my closest friends who just lives around the corner is a... Jewish, he's been in the Labour Party 60 years. We were chatting about this last week, and he can't ever remember, in all his time in the Labour Party, he was the leader of the local council, ever heard anyone say anything anti-Semitic. I mean, literally, if you are anti-Semitic, you're, you're not going to want to join the Labour Party, because predominantly, we, we had m many more Jewish MPs than the Tories did. And some of them had to bring security, personal security, with them to Labour Party conference because there was deemed such a threat in their life. Yeah, but it's that, a shocking situation. Kevin. I mean, we hear all this stuff about the, the death threats on the internet and things like that. I, mean, but I've had all of that politically, but it wasn't necessarily coming from Labour Party people. You don't know where it's. I mean, people don't put their name and address down when they're threatening to kill someone. And they won't be from Labour Party people. And why do they need armed security to enter the Labour Party conference? I just think that's a really shocking indictment of the state of the party. There were also 
I believe, events at the conference where it was discussed whether uh, the Labour Party should accept Holocaust Memorial Day as a legitimate day. I'm not, I'm not sure if you have other views on that. Well, hang on. In my time at the GLC and as mayor, we did Holocaust Memorials every year. I think that's really important, but there are people in the, in the Labour Party now who are discussing and feel enabled to discuss whether or not that's redundant and whether or not... I have never heard mis- anyone in the Labour Party question the Holocaust. I know there's some mad people out there mm. that you know don't believe that Hitler killed six million Jews. I've never met one. I mean, and you'll not sort of get someone like that in the Labour Party. This is, all this was whipped up to undermine Jeremy. And you had you really ridiculous statements like three main Jewish papers all saying, you know, we face a, a, a great crisis and so on. No. Under Jeremy, I've known Jeremy 45 years. He's never said anything racist, homophobic, anti-Semitic. He spent his entire life campaigning for a more tolerant world. But if any other community in this country, minority community, came out and said that, would you, do you think you'd be so quick to disregard them and say, oh, it's just a conspiracy to get rid of Jeremy? Not disregarding them, just saying engage with Jeremy. I mean, meet Jeremy, talk to him. Well, look, I think, um, I'm so sorry we kept you so long and that I think last well, bit that's dragged right. out You're a lot. You're paying me $20,000. Yeah. <laughs> but thank you so much My for pleasure. sitting down. Um, I learned some things. Um, maybe you did too. <laughs> To stay up to date with Reason, click subscribe here if you're on YouTube and press the alarm bell. And if you're on Facebook, hit the like button and under following, click see first. Please help Reason to grow as a movement by making a donation to us.